Is can you hear me? Okay. So last class we did the couple class with theory, and let me just go through the steps quickly, and then we'll continue. So in couple plus theory, you start with the Schrodinger equation, and you take a guess form for the correlated wave function, and the guess form is called an ansatz and that is an exponential operator exponential of an excitation operator uh, this is and this exponential operator has the advantage that it is by by but by construction it gives size consistent uh, wave functions okay however the fact that this is a non linear ansatz creates some complications in the method of solution and we have to adopt a completely different procedure from what we have done for Hartree-Fock or CI or perturbation theory. And that is we deal with most of the derivation in the operator form and then we convert it to uh, matrix elements of this, convert, uh, of this operator. And then we get a set of nonlinear coupled equations, which we solve in, in the usual manner, in an iterative manner. And then we found that if we put e to the power minus t in the Schrodinger equation, if we multiply it from the left, then we can show that the corresponding coupled cluster energy is basically an expectation value of a similarity transform Hamiltonian, where the operator which is doing the similarity transform is e to the power t. Now on the same equation, that is e to the power minus t a, e to the power t phi equal to e phi, if we project from the left with some excited functions, which correspond to the excited determinants that can be reached by the t's in my uh, in my theory, then I get the equations for getting the values of the amplitudes of the T operators. So here, instead of calling them coefficients of the T operator, we call them amplitudes. <coughs> okay. And so if I'm doing a if I'm considering excitation operators which only take me to singly and doubly excited determinants, the my corresponding truncated couple cluster theory is called CCSD, couple cluster singles doubles. And then the excited determinants that I project with are the singly excited and doubly excited determinants. Okay. And this is, uh, and the right hand side is zero because we have considered intermediate normalization for our wave function. So the overlaps of all the excited determinants with the Hartree-Fock determinant are zero. Okay. Then we spoke about some alternative solution strategies, which is just for perspective. Okay. So if you don't uh, remember them, no problem. And then our task was to evaluate the matrix elements of the similarity transform Hamiltonian. And to do that, we need some mathematical tools one of which is the baker campbell hausdorff expansion which tells me that the similarity transformed hamiltonian can or a similarity transformed operator can be written as a linear combination of nested commutators of those operators and <clears throat> this is something we will use and the fact that this expansion exists also allows a natural truncation of the exponential parameterization because we saw that for every commutator we uh, reduce one operator in the creation annihilation string of the Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian at most has four uh, creation annihilation operators in the two body term so that is the longest string in the Hamiltonian so I can at most have a uh, nested commutator of level 4 because every 
uh, commutator will reduce one of the operators. And once we exhaust the operators in the in the so-called central uh, term, central quantity, which is the Hamiltonian in this case, you cannot have any further commutators because there are no more operators. Then we showed how to write. Okay, no, that we've done before. How to show the Hamiltonian in terms of creation and generation operators. And the excitation operators also, of course, can be written in terms of creation and relation operators. Okay. And just, uh, so this is an obvious point, but an important point that the T operators, which are also called cluster operators or excitation operators, they commute among themselves, but they don't commute with the Hamiltonian. And then the second... Uh, mathematical tool which we will need is the Wick's theorem. So this is uh, requires a bit of a different concept where we introduce the concept of normal ordering, which means deciding a particular order for a string of creation annihilation operators. And what is this order? This order is that you place all annihilation operators to the right of the creation operator. And whenever you speak of normal order, it is always with respect to a certain function, which we call the vacuum. And the idea is that when you operate the string of creation annihilation operators on the in normal order on the vacuum, so the normal ordering is such an order that if the operators are in that order, then its action on the vacuum will annihilate more or less the basic concept and for different vacuums the then the rule changes slightly so for the true vacuum which is the easiest to understand it just means that you place all annihilation operators to the right of the creation operator okay and in the true vacuum there is no electrons you cannot annihilate anything so action of any annihilation operator doesn't matter which one will annihilate the vacuum. And among the annihilation operators and among the creation operators, you have the freedom of uh, ordering. So normal ordering doesn't tell you how to order the creation among themselves and annihilation among themselves. However, this normal ordered string will have a sign depending on uh, the exact position of your operators. Okay. So I hope that is clear to you. And then, yeah, so because the action of any normal ordered string on its reference vacuum is zero, expectation values uh, with respect to the vacuum for all normal ordered strings are also zero. That's pretty obvious. Then we saw how to convert an ordinary string of creation annihilation operators to normal order. So I took an arbitrary string A. And then I applied the original anti-commutation rules of creation annihilation operators to uh, shift all the annihilation operators to the right of the creation operators. So this is so here we have not used the Wicks theorem. Okay, so this is just a usual procedure to go from the ordinary string to the normal ordered string. Then. Then I actually came to the statement of Wick's theorem. And in the statement of Wick's theorem, there is also the concept of a contraction. So a contraction basically means uh, a term where you have uh, reduced a pair of creation annihilation operators to a delta function or to some value. So, we, uh, so, so we, uh, we'll understand that a bit better once we continue with the Wick theorem. And the statement of the Wick theorem is that, or the definition of a contraction from Wick's theorem is that it is the difference between the ordinary string and the normal ordered string. Okay. And in order to define the normal ordered string, 
uh, Wick proposed that you use curly braces as an operator. So it is an operator which normal orders any string. Okay? But this operator does not, uh, it just uh, switches the positions of the creation annihilation operators inside it in order to put the annihilation to the right of the creation. Okay? And in doing so, you gain a sign. Because like I said, you have a you have the freedom of organizing the creation among them uh, or ordering the creation among themselves and the annihilation among themselves. Okay? So, because of that, there is, uh, you have a choice of sign and this sign is decided by the number of interchanges you need to convert the original string inside the bracket into a normal ordered string. And, and which normal ordered string you will convert to is up to you. And depending upon that, you have a sign. Okay. So it's not unique in that sense. Okay, any normal ordered string can differ from an exactly equivalent string by a sign. Okay. <clears throat> which is also intuitive in the sense that the criteria for defining a normal order is that it annihilates the vacuum. So whether it is A or minus A, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it, if it, as long as it annihilates the vacuum. And in comparing the usual procedure with anti-commutators to the uh, action of the curly brace operator, we see that the curly brace operator acting on A over here will basically give you just will give you just this part. Okay. So the rest of the terms are all the contraction terms. And that is why the contraction is defined as the difference of the ordinary string and the normal ordered string. So the Wicksian is basically an alternative statement of the usual procedure of application of anti-commutation relation. It's just a reorganization of the terminology and the, uh, and you know, it's more concise in a way than the usual procedure. <clears throat> and even that little bit of advantage will help us. Okay, we will see that. We will see that today, hopefully. So fine. So this was it. And then I uh, told you the rule for changing. I already mentioned it today as well. So there's a little bit of imprecision in this statement. So let me see. But gains a minus n for not every interchange, but for n interchanges. Anyway, so let's now continue with today's lecture. So now we have the Wick's theorem in terms of the normal ordered operators. And okay, and the other thing that we saw was that if you have an expectation value of an operator, once you've, uh, no, let me, is it possible to copy that? I guess not. Okay, so if you have, uh, I hope you remember that, expect, that expression for A in terms of the <clears throat> contracted terms and the, uh, let me show it to you anyway. Yeah. This one. Okay. Is it possible to copy this? Oh, 
copy this. No, I can't. Okay. So if you remember that term, then uh, you will see that there is one term with the product of delta functions and all the others have some string of operators in normal order. So even the strings, the shorter strings that you that remained after doing a contraction is in normal order. So when you take an expectation value with respect to the vacuum, then only the first term, which has the product of delta functions, will survive. All the other terms will, uh, will give you a zero. So which means that any expectation value of a normal ordered operator or, 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 of, or of any operator with respect to the vacuum <coughs> Can, uh, oh no, okay, let me let me phrase it a little bit differently. So if I write an operator in terms of contractions and the normal and its normal ordered form, then if I take the expectation value of this operator with respect to the vacuum, then the only surviving term is the fully contracted term. Which means that if I want to evaluate, if I want to evaluate an operator, or oh, sorry, evaluate the, evaluate the expectation value of an operator with respect to a function, then by normal ordering A with respect to the same function as vacuum for the normal ordering, I can reduce my calculation to the evaluation of only the fully contracted term. Now this is a very big advantage okay? which means that I can simplify <coughs> the at the operator level and eventually I only have to evaluate some products of delta function. Because the vacuum is also uh, normalized, so that overlap will always be one. So my, so the value of my expectation value will just be a set of uh, delta functions multiplied by the by some integral that will be there, the integral of uh, a. But it, it simplifies my numerical computation. So I do the algebra beforehand and I only implement a simple function numerically. So we will, uh, so we can do that for the Hamiltonian for instance. Okay. And we will do that in a moment. But before that we will change the vacuum of our normal ordering. So now we want to talk about what happens if we take the Hartree-Fock function as a vacuum. Now why are we doing that? If we took the <coughs> true vacuum and we wanted to evaluate matrix elements or expectation values of the Hartree-Fock function, then every Hartree-Fock function would have to be written as a string of creation operators 
n in number n number of creation operators where n is the number of electrons in my system acting on the true vacuum okay and on top of that let's say if i wanted to now evaluate the expectation of value of the hamiltonian with respect to the hartree-fock function i would have two n strings just from representing the bra and ket function and my hamiltonian would have the one body has two so two n plus two strings of two n plus two uh, operators and some two n plus four operators so that's a huge number because number of electrons in the system can be very large so instead of going this route then <clears throat> we change the vacuum for normal ordering from the true vacuum to the Hartree-Fock function which is also called the Fermi vacuum. As you can see this nomenclature is coming from condensed matter physics. So then what is the implication on my uh, Wick's theorem or what is the implication on the definition of my normal ordering? So what is the basic principle? The basic principle is that a normal ordered string of operator will annihilate the vacuum ref with reference to which it has been defined. So that means that if I have a i dagger where i is a occupied orbital, then I know that its action on phi Hartree-Fock is zero because it annihilates phi Hartree-Fock. So here it is a creation operator which is annihilating the Hartree-Fock if it is labeled by an occupied orbital. On the other hand, if it is labeled by a virtual orbital, then if you have an annihilation operator, that will annihilate the Hartree-Fock vacuum. So now I say, so here see, before we were looking at only the fact of whether the operator is daggered or undaggered. Okay. And then I say that all undaggered operators lie to the right of the daggered operators. That was my definition of normal order. But now, I, I have to also look at the labels of the operators. If it is an occupied label, then I need to put it to the right of all the occupied uh, undaggered operators. And if it is, a, it is labeled by a virtual orbital, then I need to put all the annihilation operators or undaggered operators to the right of all the daggered orbitals labeled by virtual orbitals. So now the normal ordering becomes a little bit more complicated. So the normal ordering now means that uh, for occupied orbitals, all daggered operators are on the right of all undaggered operators for virtual orbitals it is the reverse all undaggered operators on the right of dagger operators. So these are called then uh, now quasi particle creation annihilation operators. So then some people will 
then say that B i is equal to A i dagger and B a is equal to A a. And they will say that the Bs are called quasi particle creation annihilation operators. However, I find writing the A's as B's again and remembering this sort of relation uh, more confusing. So I just prefer to go with. Uh, looking at the labels every time, okay, and just keeping everything in terms of A. This is also what is done in the notes uh, that I circulated. And I sort of side with that. But just to mention that you, you will see many books or papers also which go with B. And then they will also rename the Bs as A again, okay, telling you that so, and now we will only deal with uh, Quasi particle creation annihilation operators, and so we call the B's A's. So that has confused me to no end when I started out. So I think it's just best to stick to A, which are real particle creation annihilation operators, and just remember that the definition of normal ordering. Uh, don't remember the you. Don't remember the fact that it's just annihilations to the right of creation. Remember the fact that the string should be such that it annihilates the vacuum. If you remember that much, then you will see the rest will follow logically. Then, let's go to the, to how this is useful now. And of course, uh, with this sort of uh, notation, now you can figure out which contractions are valid, which are not. So I can, I'll just summarize it for you because we don't have much time. So I'll just summarize it. So the only possible non-zero contractions now of quasi-particle operators. They are AI dagger AJ, which has a value of delta IJ, or it is AA AB dagger contracted and that is equal to delta AB. So these are the only uh, non-zero contractions. If you have AJ AI dagger for instance this is zero or yeah okay anyway and all the rest are also zero. And if you have like mixed uh, indices, they are also zero. So, because they are, uh, they cannot be contracted. So, for contractions, the values are always delta functions. So, if you have two mutually, two labels from two mutually exclusive sets, so one label from the occupied and one label from the unoccupied, then then they are of course all also all zero. Okay. Now we will write the. Hamiltonian in normal order. Hamiltonian in normal order. <coughs> so, my Hamiltonian as in terms of creation annihilation operators 
as you would call it in second quantization has two terms the one body term and the two body term now in the one body operator so if i was to write ap dagger aq in normal order i would get the normal ordered string So what this means is that I have, I am contracting AP dagger with AQ and here of course I have no more operators left but if I did have some operators which are not connected by this bracket on top, uh, this bracket means that the normal ordering operation would then have to be carried out on the uh, remaining uncontracted operators. Pay attention to the language because uh, then we start using this language repetitively. So if, if the implication is not clear to you, just, just ask me. Okay. So remember these brackets are operators. So be careful when you put them and when you don't put them. Okay. If you want to just, you know, uh, use some bracket to separate parts of strings for convenience, as you normally would in an algebraic expression, then don't use curly brackets when you're dealing with uh, second quantized operations. Just use simple brackets. Then, let's see. So this contraction term will give me a delta PQ. And if I take an expectation value with respect to, so, okay, okay, so let me just write it. So I have some PQ. In trying to hurry, I might, you know. So here you see P and Q are general indices over here. But if you have a contraction where the dagger is before the uh, undaggered operator, then the only non-zero contraction is delta ij. So it means that the P and Q uh, that when P and Q are both poles, only then I will have a delta. And if P and Q are both particles, then I come here and then that value is zero. So instead of delta PQ, this basically reduces to delta uh, P belongs to I, Q belongs to J, or if you want to be even more unambiguous, you say 
P belongs to. Occupied Q belongs to. Do you get it? So if this normal ordering is now with respect to the Hartree Fock vacuum, then the only non zero contraction is the one where both P and Q belong to the occupied space. Okay, so here I, I will. Uh, I'll make one more clarification. So remember, we were writing curly braces with a subscript of V so far, while it was in the true vacuum. But when I am not writing anything, that is the Hartree Fock vacuum. So this is uh, the, this is the notation that I, I will follow, because all the rest of the uh, theory will be with the Hartree Fock as vacuum. And that is what is used uh, everywhere, actually. Using the true vacuum is not common at all, at least in quantum chemistry. OK. So this is this. So then this belongs to IJ. So basically, this sum now is reduced to PHQ delta P belongs to I, Q belongs or occupied, Q belongs to occupied. And you have then some I, I, H, I. Okay. So basically, all the terms where P and Q are not I and J are removed. And you only have the i equal to j term from due to the delta function. So you have this. You can do the same thing for uh, for the two body operator. I will just do one string quickly. And you can look at the rest of the steps from the book or the notes. Because if I write all the steps, I will not finish today. So this is the normal ordered term. And then you have to evaluate or enumerate, not evaluate, enumerate all the con contractions possible. So let's write only the non-zero contractions. So that will reduce the amount I have to write. So for single contractions, I take only the uh, daggers with the undaggered. Okay. So I have one where it's this. Then I have another one. Which is I'm basically repeating the same string, the original string, and just changing the position of this uh, over brace, or over, over bracket, or whatever you call it. So there. So now I have all the four. These are called singly contracted terms. This is the normal ordered term. These are the singly contracted terms. Now we'll do the doubly contracted terms. So what are the options for the doubly contracted? P with S, Q with R. P with R, Q with S. 
So you have only these two options. These are the doubly contracted. And in this case, they are also fully contracted. And then now we know uh, since all these operators have the dagger before the undaggered operator, then these general indices become restricted to the occupied space. Okay. So I can simplify this to keep the dagger. So this is the normal order term that has no simplification. But here I can write, so I'm just writing, okay, no, I don't want to, let's go to P belongs to occupied, S belongs to occupied, and you have A, Q, dagger, they are, and then you have delta, P belongs to occupied. R belongs to occupied. AQ dagger OS. Delta Q belongs to occupied. S belongs to occupied. AQ dagger OR. Plus delta Q belongs to occupied. Then the doubly contracted, these are all uh, occupied, so P occupied, S occupied, delta Q occupied, R occupied, plus delta P occupied, S occupied, delta So the only uh, generalized indices remaining now are the ones which are uh, not contracted, so the free operators. Then when I multiply this with the two, two body integrals in the Hamiltonian. So I would then put back this expression in over here, like we did for the one particle case. Okay. And then we will simplify the sums. So there are four index sums, P, Q, R, S. And here we have the delta functions which will reduce these sums. So you, you will have eventually either, so when there is a one delta function, the sum over four indices in the Hamiltonian will be reduced to three indices. When you have two delta functions, you will reduce the sum to two indices. Okay. You can also then group together some of these terms because of the symmetry of the integrals. So I'm not going through all the steps. They are done in the book, so you don't you will not have a problem. And once you do that, you will end up with a Hamiltonian which has an operator part, a one body operator part, PQ. I 
along with the just an integral part. So this is just a number. Oh, sorry, I forgot to write the operators here. And then you have the two body, which is basically sum two of i. So this I am copying from the book, okay? So hopefully our derivation will also lead to the same expression. Get this and this. Can you identify what this this is the expression for? So this is simply the expression for the expectation value of the Hamiltonian with respect to the Hartree-Fock function. Okay, because H plus 1 by R12, that is the Fock operator. Then this can be written as okay. or, or I can also do it directly. And, and this is a one body operator in normal order form that is called the normal ordered Fock operator. And this is the two body operator accompanied by a normal ordered string. So this is called the normal ordered two body term. Okay. And I can then write this as the normal ordered terms plus simply Phi zero or phi hat What what would have we been calling it? Hat Okay. Okay. So what has happened? So when we rewrote the Hamiltonian in terms of normal ordered operators plus contraction, then we saw that the fully contracted terms give me a number. So, so my Hamiltonian operator itself got split into an operator part and a number part. And this number part is simply the uh, expectation value of the Hamiltonian with respect to the Hartree-Fock function, which is, well, in general, I can say it is the vacuum. And then the operators which remained are now in normal order because they have the brackets. So this is actually a general statement. So here we have done this procedure for the Hamiltonian with the hartree fock vacuum. So under these two specific uh, conditions, but in general also, the rule is that the normal order 
form of an operator is the operator original operator minus the minus minus its reference or vacuum expectation value that is h normal order is basically h minus phi r for This is what we showed that h that h minus the expectation value is the is h n. So unfortunately, we are we have run out of time today. So I think I will have to take a little bit of Friday's class to finish this. But I did promise to touch on DFT. So are you all interested in uh, knowing a little bit about DFT or would you like to do more on couple cluster? So I'll stop here and I'll also stop sharing my screen.